Thank you very much for being here. Um, as I said in the panel, I work on mobile systems and mobile data. Um, so um, I'd like to um, give you an introduction of um, what, what opportunities this sort of data can give and then discuss the challenges and obviously the limitations and what we can do about them. So um, devices are in the pockets of uh, people and um, you know, they're everywhere and they reach even uh, people that weren't reached before in regions and in scale that we haven't seen. Um, they take all sorts of forms. Uh, they're not just your phones, but they are, uh, technology is getting smaller and is getting more useful, hopefully. Uh, well, we'll see about that, but, but that, that's the idea. So although we are not quite a Star Trek level with the technology, uh, well, we, we, we don't have teleporting, certainly. We start to have a few things that, um, that my, yeah, maybe. Um, we start to have a few things that were considered science fictions before. So um, translation devices, our phones can already do that. Um, this is uh, the tricorder the devices that um, were in, in science fiction used to monitor an environment with waves, with radio, and understand something about that environment or person, um, it, it, it becomes to sound familiar. And of course, um, earpieces and um, devices where we touch are already there. So what kind of sensors are we talking about? What kind of data is generated by these devices? Well, of course, you have all sorts of radios um, um, that uh, can be used. But, um, the, the, the device that you carry in your pocket itself already has very simple uh, sensors that can tell a lot about us. Um, accelerometers to monitor movement, uh, light sensors, cameras, but the microphone as well, uh, which is at the same time powerful and, and scary. So um, in, the, in this um, rough half an hour, I want to give you um, a view of uh, three applications that um, we worked on and other researchers have worked on uh, with the sort of geographical and sensor data of this kind that uh, can advance our knowledge. Um, the first one is to measure our city function, so urban computing, how can we make sense of the population and the use of space um, outdoor. Um, then uh, looking at interactions and people indoor, um, looking at um, the use of in, on buildings and uh, interactions in offices and how we can transform health. Um, and I, I've, I've hinted a little bit on this already in the panel. So for the first one, um, for how we can um, measure our city's work, well, already uh, for individual perspective, you, if you use Google Maps um, and, and from your phone, you can, uh, in, in your small scale, or already export the Google Map data and get a view uh, of your movements, uh, of what Google collects about your movements and how to make, make a view um, and, and perhaps visualization or get a feeling um, or an awareness of this kind of uh, data. But there, is, there are other services that exploit the location, so the, the radio and the GPS information that uh, a phone or a wearable gives. Um, this is um, a, a service that people use to tell each other where they are, um, specifically like I'm in this, uh, I'm in the, the touring today, I can tell my friends that, I can inform the service of that. And with this sort of crowdsourced data, and there are various kinds, um, people have started using it to build um, an understanding of the use of cities uh, at a granularity that is somehow unprecedented um, in terms of both space and time especially because um, we, we're using GPS, we can reach very low granularity, um, but also because the service is used globally, so we have a global view of various cities, uh, but also temporally because uh, we, we, we can see the movement of peop people at, at the dynamics of the hourly or even um, less, um, as a smaller scale level. Now, if I were to find my mouse on the screen, which I did, I could give you a little animation of this. So this is New York, and the different colors are different categories. Um, so arts and entertainment in red, college in black, uh, shops in white, and my mouse has disappeared while I was trying to do that. Really, that's not very useful. So here we are again. Give you breathing space to 
There you go. So it's different, different times of day. The city is used differently. The, the dimension of the circle is how many people are in that particular location. So for some cities, this data is representative. I can, um, I can give a complete talk on the biases of this data and how it needs to be used carefully. We heard Heather this morning. She was absolutely right. We need to look at the problems um, as well as, oh, yeah, we have this beautiful data. We can use it. Uh, but th there is a, there's quite a bit that can be done. Um, so um, to give you an idea, this is uh, hourly um, day of the week. So this is the day of the week, hourly description of a type of venue. Can you guess which venue this could be, given this temporal pattern, for example? Uh, it is not restaurants. The reason why it's not restaurants is very similar. That's a good guess. But this peak would be higher in restaurants. Uh, it's lunchtime, right? Um, no, it's not bars. Uh, the morning peak. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually gyms. Uh, some audiences have guessed this before. This is how you go to the gym. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, if, if you have longitudinal data of this kind, you can also uh, think of studying growth of cities. And um, this is new places in London uh, between 2011 and 2014. So this is London, the heat mass. Obviously, the centers are important. And the development of more places. And look at here. So this is more, more venues than expected. So there's a, a, a big, uh, big dot there. Can you guess what? What has generated that increase in number of new places, new venues in London at that particular time? It was the Olympics, yes. This is a London audience. That was easy. <laughs> um, so so this, is, this is GPS data. This is um, radio data, localization data. And I've only, again, given you um, a couple of um, examples of what this can be used for. There is, however, other data that can be used to understand uh, movement and behavior. And it comes in the forms of uh, accelerometer. This is uh, Fitbit reports of uh, steps and, and how, how you're moving. Um, but more counterintuitively, uh, we've, we've done a study where we have looked at how this data could be used to understand if you're following the same path. Um, by just using accelerometer and gyroscope, you can tell if you are, in fact, going from home to the office, because I'm take, the intuition is here that I'm taking the same turns. So when I take the same turns, even if now is rush hour and it wasn't yesterday, we can still identify that sort of pattern. And, and, and even if you don't have location data today, um, we had it yesterday and we match that trace and we can still say you're going to the office today. Um, so the trace could be different, but it has some indication of being the same from yesterday, although yesterday perhaps it was a rush hour. Um, so um, in, in addition to looking at um, how this data can tell us uh, something about how we behave outdoor, um, there is a lot that can be done in understanding and helping how we can, how we can make our life better indoor. Uh, we've used a variety of devices um, that use a variety of radios, and also we have devised one that is able to understand the angle of interactions that you have with your neighbor. So am I meeting someone face to face um, at this time, and am I really facing him all the time like that, or how am I approaching other people? There, there are different aspects that can be studied. And uh, just, again, a glimpse, um, and I'll, I'll make you analyze this graph yourself. So these are people meeting face to face in two different buildings. So a research organization studied for three months before they moved building and how they interacted. So people are organized on the x-axis, uh, this like, like 21, 22 people, x-axis, y-axis, the same people, uh, group by research group. So these people, when you have a, 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 a darker square there, is because they're meeting a lot in that time. Um, so you know, um, these two people are meeting a lot. Old building, new building. What has changed? More interaction, um, yes, in a way, in general, more interactions. But where is this more interaction? Can we say? Uh, the groups here are organized in order. So I belong to this group if my ID is this. I belong to this group if my ID is this. I belong to this group if my ID is this. 
What do we see? What has changed? We have more interactions in these parts. Greater interaction across groups. We can't say, we, we, we can't claim causality. We only know about interaction. So if they are collaborating, we don't know. Um, we only know that they are meeting more. And it turns out if we then study the, this, this result with building uh, structure, it turns out that in fact, it's um, the, the, they had introduced in this new building uh, more meeting place, uh, a bigger cafeteria. Um, so, so there is an effect. So the, the, the architects were, were studying this interaction uh, and results. And we've done an additional study on understanding how people face each other. And for example, um, if you have four or five people working on a challenge or a study together, what's the approach to others? What's the interaction? Can we study how they're sitting together or they're facing each other um, changes the way um, the challenges carried forward. Um, and this is really pretty much uh, ongoing work. And this is just to say um, this, that there are other types of data beyond what we see in the news that are coming out and we need to study and we need to understand and we need to understand both how much data we can get but also how much uh, we can control and, 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 and you know, know what they can do, know their potential. Um, we can also transform health uh, with this sort of data. And this is, this is really close to my heart because as I said um, before, I think this is the, the power of um, scaling our reachability of diagnosis, scaling our reachability of uh, information and of uh, understanding. So uh, one of the diseases that we are working with clinicians uh, right at the moment, and um, there's an event in the touring um, in about um, a couple of weeks on um, using technology to um, help on, on, on all sorts of level Alzheimer diagnosis and, and clinical testing. Um, one, of, one thing um, I've been um, um, well, lectured about is that the first um, signs of Alzheimer, uh, even before someone really realizes, uh, are related to the spatial cognition. So you kind of begin to forget where you're going, how you're going to certain places. And so being a mobility researcher, um, we, we are trying to understand if by collecting um, users' data on mobility throughout the day, we can build models and algorithm to do early Alzheimer detection of potential genetically prone uh, individuals that we, we isolate. So if, um, apparently, again, in Alzheimer, I speak apparently because I'm not a clinician, but in Alzheimer, um, the idea is now to tr is try not to catch the disease too late. Um, and so any sort of symptoms that we can detect through the technology used by people is, uh, is, really, is really useful. I know you're thinking, you're probably freaking out saying, well, this, this is my data uh, going around in Cambridge. And, and it's quite, quite sensitive, right? It's uh, every 30 seconds location data. Do we really want to collect this data on larger population? The second part of my talk is about um, discussing these issues. Um, other aspects we want to look at are related to mental health. Mental health is a big problem. Um, there seem to be indications that behavior and mental health um, and, and, and diagnostic of, of mental health could be helped with, uh, with, with behavior and, and, and sensing. And this uh, is a glimpse service study we've done with mobile phones. This is only 150 people in this, in, in this particular display. Um, however, we had, we had um, um, very many thousands of participants in the study over three years. And we're just scratching the surface of the analysis of this data and understanding how we can use it to help. Um, so 150 people, um, we, in, in this visualization, okay, this is weekdays, this is weekend, these are the hours of the day. On the top there um, is the activity of the accelerometer of a group of people that is actually, in fact, also reporting their mood as being happier. These are the less happy people, and these are the even less Pe less people. So um, we, we have papers I can, I can link you to them if you're interested, but the idea is um, it's not just studies have shown in the past that uh, physical activity is uh, an indication of mental health. So um, people generally tend to move less if they have uh, mood 
issues. Here we find, however, that it's about, it's, the accelerometer is something more subtle than just activity. It, it's at a level that indicates that you somehow, one might say someone might have a life. So it's not just about the mobility, it could be about picking up the phone and phoning someone. Um, so, so there are other aspects that uh, could be looked at, and, and this is just uh, scratching the surface of what, what, what this actually means. Uh, we've also looked at how um, the microphone can be used um, to understand emotions um, from, from a phone. So the fact that I speak now um, could allow my phone to do analysis of my voice and understand uh, my emotions. And, uh, and this is work that um, I have not done, but uh, a colleague in MIT is doing, and it was featured in Big Bang Theory. If you are a fan of Big Bang Theory, the episode is season 10, episode 14. In some talks, I usually, um, I, I usually broadcast it. But uh, here I will just say that it's not just about the So I talked about microphone, I talked about accelerometers. And this study and, and, and other studies are related to the fact that Radio receivers um, that, or well, broadcasters, let's uh, say, that are put in this room could be used to, um, let's say, uh, broadcast waves that reflect on my body. And for the way they are reflecting on my body, they can tell how fast my heartbeat is and how quickly my breathing is, and therefore emotions and, 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 and a variety of things. This is um, starting to be used on infants to detect if they're sleeping, uh, or in, um, in care homes to detect how patients are doing uh, without visualization, but just with waves. So it's passive sensing. So there's also that dimension. I mainly worked on active sensing, but there is a wave of new data related. And you don't have a device in your, on your body, right? It's all somewhere else. So. Yeah, so now I guess we're here <laughs> on the aspects of challenges and limitations. So um, first of all, do we trust the data? Um, as I research in this area, um, I, I have a lot to say, but I, I try to put myself in the perspective of the user. This is data of a sleep sensor that I use. And um, this is a particular day where I knew that I wasn't quite sleeping at least twice during that night. And so looking at this data as, as seeing this makes me, make me even doubt um, if the sensor is at all working. So we, we need to get to the stage where people start to trust what we have. And, and we're not quite there, certainly. Not only that. Uh, we know that we can't trust the data for our models. Uh, the models need to be more sensitive. So if you see, if you see a person walking uh, quite fast, and then a person running up this, not running, climbing up a set of stairs, you as a human would be able to distinguish them. There are often cases where you, looking at accelerometer features like this might not be enough for the model to be distinguishing those corner cases. And those are the ones that allow us to then uh, become very skeptical of, of what's happening. So we're still, we're still at this phase where there's a lot of noise. The sensors we're using are cheap sensors that are put in phones or in devices for other purposes. The, the accelerometer was put um, in the device to understand the rotation of your device. Um, and that, that was the pure function of it. And now we're using it for all sorts of things. Um, the other thing that I hinted at in, um, in the panel is that there seemed to be uh, an, an understanding or complacency on the fact that all the data should go in the cloud. All the analysis should be done in the cloud because it's efficient and the business models behind it work because of that. Well, first of all, um, this cloud computing is often not a very good solution in places that would benefit a, a large deal of using this sort of technology. Um, and developing regions are just one example. This is a slide I stole from my Google colleague. Um, not stole, there's an act there. <laughs> I did tell him. Um, so this is how your connectivity works in the US. So you see 
you probably don't need to read the legend there, but um, the colors are just different. Your, your experience and your, um, your numbers on how your connectivity would work in this country would be just different. So an application that is developed to work here to send data and get replies from the cloud would not work in the same way, let's just say that, in these countries. And then there's the aspect of privacy. Um, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have seen this uh, breach of privacy um, of, of this trial? Yes, a few. How many of you have not seen it? Let's try it that way. Uh, some of you, so, so just one minute. Um, this is data from Strava, which is one of these um, exercise applications that use your movement to uh, upload the data. And uh, these are soldiers exercising in a military base, classified um, paths around the military base. So there was a big cry out saying, well, this data can just tell you, tell everyone that this is how, how the base looks like. So the, you know, collecting lots of data to, um, for the benefit of the population can have this uh, very big side effect. We know that location data, no matter how many times you anonymize it, um, is, is, is not anonymizable to a good extent because uh, only having, because we are so unique in our patterns that only having one or two points um, indicate that your, your trace can be de-anonymized very easily. So, um, so I, I'm here, I live with, with with this dilemma, especially for mobile health. And, and this is the, the comparison I give. We have a good drug or a good diagnosis techniques, but we have a number of side effects. That's where we are. So we don't want to throw away the baby with the water, mm -hmm. but we want to minimize the side effects because, because we're not accepting the side effects at all. Um, and so my, um, I cannot do it by myself, and uh, we, we just said before about collaboration, we said a lot about being a community, and yes, we can work on governance, we can work on ethics, we can work on all the aspects related to the legal framework and to education, but as a system researcher, I can work on giving, informing the public on understanding how much of this can be brought down to the edge or to the device. How much of this really needs to get out of my device so that I'm able to help the person that uses that device. Now, the, the devices we have these days are actually very powerful. are probably more powerful than my first computer, which tells a lot about both the computer and myself. Um, but the, the, so, so they contain a number of uh, very efficient um, computational units beside the CPU. One is uh, the, the DSP, which is a coprocessor that is already used by, um, by the operating system and the, the vendors to um, calculate um, and improve the sampling and the analysis of accelerometer data, but also there is a very powerful GPU. And we've done some analysis proving that in effect, if you send the data um, to, the, to, to, to the cloud, instead of using the GPU, you're actually worse off um, in terms of energy efficiency. If you're trying to take your, if you make your phone last a day, for example, um, it might be for, for some computation, this was audio computation and it was uh, in a specific uh, microphone data that we analyzed, but we're trying to start to prove that we can bring models down to the device and we can do analytics on some computational units that we didn't think before. And I think I, somehow I define that as a sort of my role um, to, to, to prove that this cloud model, uh, yes, might have business benefits, but it might not be the only way to go. And this is, this is in fact the graph I was talking about and I will um, quickly um, then, then stop after this to get some questions, but um, so this is, uh, for example, I, I think this was keyword spotting application where we tried to understand the voice of the user and, uh, um, and, and uh, recognize keywords on device. So um, by using the GPU efficiently, the energy consumption with respect to using, those are just uh, megabits per second of sending to the GPU, to, to the cloud. So five, 10, um, and 20. Uh, the energy consumption was actually very good. So why not consider those models? Why not open up to this sort of solutions? 
This is not an answer for everything because uh, to some extent, some data is needed in the cloud to build the models or to uh, do group analytics or to do other things, but there needs to be a balance of the two. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much.